Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass podcast. This for UFC 289. This episode of the Dogger Pass podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass podcast are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code DOP when making a new account to get a match up to $100 on your first deposit. Cody, we're in Canada. It's been so long. Yes. It's been so long since they've had a live live event, live pay-per-view on home soil. Hashtag sorry gift for like Canadian Commission. I know you, Cody's not allowed to say anything because he does like matchmaking and stuff. And he's got to work with these people in different areas. So hashtag sorry gift, you know, Canadian sorry um, for like maybe some of the poor decisions that will, will come in and some of the home cooking that happens on Canadian soil. It is what it is. We don't necessarily agree with it. We are happy to have a fight back on Canadian soil though. Yeah. Listen, I don't think it seems to matter. We all just, at least myself anyways, got massively burned by Karkov France decision last time out. So it doesn't seem to matter where you are, Paul, bad decisions, I guess, are to be expected. No good. What I don't understand is, yeah, they haven't been to Canada in a long time. Finally, it's like, you know what? We're going back to Canada. You guys still va- need vaccinations to get in. We're like, Nope, we're going back to Canada. Perfect. Everything sailed. You'd think that they'd go to Toronto, biggest market, sell out a massive venue, put on a nice pay-per-view card together. No, not Toronto. Maybe Montreal. Montreal's, you know, held some of the biggest UFC pay-per-views that have ever been on Canadian soil. Again, a lot of fight fans, big market. No. And then they teased Calgary. It's like, okay, well, they owe Calgary from like that awful like UFC 149 card back in the day. Sure, they owe them a makeup card. Okay. It ends up in BC. And it's an 11-fight card. And it's headlined by... <laughs> Uh, like, I don't know, like Nunez, she's the GOAT, so it's no discredit to her whatsoever. I just don't want to see this as a headliner. I don't really care. Like, what's the other big fight? So they give you Benil Darius versus Charles Oliveira. Nice. You get Danny Gay versus Nate Landwehr. Very nice. Nasser Dinimovov, Chris Curtis. That's a prelim. Don't even got to pay for that one. So, I don't know. I don't think it's the strongest card out there. But again, you can complain about cards all you want, and you can look at it from an entertainment perspective and a gambling perspective. And from those perspectives... Of course, I'm excited to see it, Paul. Yeah, it's a it's a banger fight night card with a unanticipated title fight up top. Like that's basically what it is. Like I'm excited for the fights. I think there's a lot of really really fun fights top to bottom. But before we get into that, I got uh, I got owned pretty much immediately on Twitter. Sorry, I forget who uh, who posted the video of me. D Spearman. Yeah. Well, shouts to you. I uh, did not fulfill the two shoeys that I had to last episode. So let's get after it, and then we'll get into the fights. Yeah, technically, small complaint. I still feel unfulfilled by this wager because by winning a two shoey bet, I think the audience expected to see two shoey Shaughnessy. Yeah. But then you just give us one last week and just one this week, so... Didn't really get that same effect. However, man of his word, Paul Shaughnessy coming up to the plate when uh, he knew he was wrong. See, Cody can't see me because his internet connection is uh, <laughs> pretty is pretty bad. I don't know if you've noticed on any of our previous episodes, but I just cracked another one because I am a man of the people, Cody. And I mean, you may need it to get through some of these fights. I'm not going to lie. So double, double down. Well, I was thinking Canadian flavor right across the board. Like, if they're coming to Canada, it's going to be mostly Canadian guys. But I'll be honest. Like, I'm sure they did their best job of just pairing up whoever was free, available, and uninjured. But it's not as if they've even given any of them great matchups other than potentially Mike Malott. Yeah, that was not my finest effort there, Cody. I'm not going to lie. Let's get (laughs) it. Seltzers will get you. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of it's on my shirt. Thank God I'm wearing black. It is what it is. All right, let's get into the main event here. We've got Amanda, the lioness, Nunez taking on Arena Aldana. Minus 320 for Nunez, plus 265 for Aldana. It's one of those things, I mean, Amanda Nunez is kind of tough to read. Um, obviously, a lot of people did not see, um, you know, her losing the title against Juliana Pena. She's got a lot going on in her life right now, and it's like fight to fight. I think it's kind of difficult to know exactly what version of her will show up. 
But you go through the stats, you think of the previous matchups. Aldana is definitely a challenge on the feet. He's got good crisp bo- boxing, a very, very well, well-rounded well striking game. But Holly Holm took her down f- uh, five times. Macy Chason took her down three times. If Amanda Nunez comes out here, sticks to a game plan that she did in the second fight against Pena, I struggle to see how Aldana is able to fight that off. Um, I know she's probably making massive improvements all the time. I was considering a play on the underdog here, but I think that the line's probably about right. I think Amanda Nunez, if she sticks to a wrestling game plan here, it should be pretty easy work. So uh, Amanda Nunez is the pick for me. I honestly feel feel like the line makers factor that into making this line minus three twenty because Amanda Nunez probably should be a minus five hundred. She's got a minus five hundred skill set in order to win this fight, and she's just she's got the back class. She's got the experience. She's the greatest woman fighter of all time. So Amanda Nunez all day. But they're factoring the same thing that you just mentioned, Paul. What version are you going to get from her? Because even when she's dominant, like there's some camps where she had things going on and, and she's got a you know a deviated septum and she can't breathe through her nose and her cardio is not all that great and she can get first round finishes but sometimes the fights that get dragged on later not that great you go back to that jermaine durandamy fight which is a god awful she had to wrestle the whole time because she was gassed out from second round onwards you know bad performance but still gets the win some of these fights felicia spencer no longer with the organization megan anderson no longer with the organization juliana pena was like a nine to one underdog when she upset her the first time for no other reason than Nunez wasn't in great shape. She gassed out. She had a great first round in that fight, for the record. Second round, she tires out. And then it, it just everything falls apart. Now, that rematch, she shows up reinvigorated. She did look career best, I thought. Her striking looked good. Her wrestling looked good. Six takedowns, two knockdowns. Uh, fight went five rounds. Cardio held up the entire time. And I think part of that is that extra layer of motivation. You know, this girl just beat me. She's tarnishing my legacy. She's talking all type of, types of wild nonsense in the media. I'm going to go shut her up and shut her down. She did exactly that. That version of Nunez shows up to fight Irene Aldana. Yeah, hard to not think that she doesn't get the takedowns. Like Holly Holm is a five-round fight, five takedowns, easily neutralizes her. Macy Chase on three takedowns over the course of three, but Aldana doesn't have that big stopping power, not that big KO power. So if she allows Nunez to close the distance, get a hold of her, take her to the ground, I would see large chunks of time just coming off the clock. Now, she's going to give her some problems. She's a decent boxer. She moves very well laterally. Not only that, but she's got 25-minute uh, cardio. She can throw a bit of a pace. So Nunez might come out here and win the first two rounds and look awesome and then gas out, fail to get the takedowns, and lose down the stretch. So if that's your angle on Aldana, don't pre-bet it. Bet it after the second or third round when you've got a better read and you can kind of see where the direction of the fight is going. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't go against Amanda Nunez on this. What I would suggest is that minus 320, minus 340, minus 350, whatever it ends up at, you could put her on your top ticket and just, it's a very easy hedge out to get that big plus money on Donna on the other side. But I think after seeing her lose to Pena, after factoring in Pat Mayo's, you know, uh, theory, which seems to just be right more often than it's not. Uh, and then, yeah, you considering she's got a kid, she's got millions of dollars. She's in her mid thirties. She has this great reputation where she has nothing to prove and, she was supposed to take on Pena for a trilogy match, and then they yank her out and they throw a completely different opponent in there in Irene Aldana. Maybe those are enough red flags to cause you to pass altogether. And she's got another kid on the way right now. Um, if you were watching, like she doesn't, but yeah, no, it's, it's life. Life is stressful well, with children. They, let me tell you, she they have another kid on the way right now. Yeah. Um, uh, Nina is like five months pregnant per uh, embedded. If you watch that this week. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, yeah, the best, if it's the best version of Amanda Nunez, she sticks to the wrestling. I think she can make this look pretty easy, uh, over on prize picks, two takedowns. I, I, I take the over there. I like it. It's not like the pillar of like all of my lineups this week over on there, but, um, you know, maybe Nunez can take her down and find a submission early, but like, I don't think she's got the greatest submission skills and Aldana's putting in. Pretty solid work with the, uh, you know, the the strawweight champion on a daily basis who's grappling, happened to look considerably better um, when she captured the belt. So I think two, three, four takedowns is not out of the equation for Amanda Nunez. So I'm adding her to some tickets over on prize picks. Uh, moving on down, we've got the co-main event. We've got Benil Dariush taking on Charles Oliveira. Minus 140 for Dariush, plus 120 for Charles Dobronx Oliveira. Who you got here, buddy? 
Yeah, this one pains me because Charles Oliver is my guy. And I think that's the separation that you need if you're going to be a serious handicapper and just someone that does it for fun. Is that got to put the emotions aside. You remember when we first started doing the show like almost 10 years ago, it's like you had some favorite fighters. Back when we were in college, you definitely had your favorite fighters. Over time, those guys retired and you never really replaced them. There's not a whole lot of guys that you're like, I like that guy on like a personal level. Like He's my favorite fighter. It's just a roster of guys. Yeah, and then you soften up for a few guys. This card actually has two of them. Nate Landwehr, who we'll talk about later, and Charles Oliveira. How could you not love the guy? Fan favorites, all-time UFC submission leader, always in thrilling fights. Got a bit of a quitter's reputation, but threw that in the rearview mirror and went on to defeat some of the best guys the sport's ever produced in crazy fashion, where he had to show that grit and he had to show that heart. Not only that, he's a harness racing guy, as myself. Spent some time to promote a Yonkers. He's going to New Zealand to promote the sport uh, after this fight. The guy's a great ambassador for the sport. He's a great guy. I do not love him. Uh, but at some point, I'd let that kind of get in the way in the Makachev fight, knowing that Makachev could very easily wreck this guy. But you've seen Nezal Makachev get chin checked by Adriano Martins. You've not really seen him have to grapple with a guy with the submission skills of a Charles Oliveira. Like there was enough reason to give Charles a chance. And I bet it on those reasonings and liking him. And he just gets thrashed. And that's the thing with Charles. He's a 50 50 guy. He's a former world champion. He obviously wins more than he loses. But he's a 50-50 guy, Paul. He's capable of winning against anybody in the world 50% of the time. And he's, like, capable of losing to, like, most guys in the division 50% of the time. Like, he, he, he's all or nothing. And you look at him versus Michael Chandler. Yeah, yeah, he wins, but he could very well lose that fight. In fact, he's on his way to losing that fight before pulling the rabbit out of the hat. Him versus Dustin Poirier it's the exact same thing. His durability is not quite there. Everybody scores multiple knockdowns on him. But uh, yeah, the guy's a, a he's a barn on fire. He comes at you. And because he's so dangerous, got underrated power, a nasty submission game, stays in your face and stays aggressive, he's capable of beating you. And he's capable of faltering as well. When I look at Benil Diriush, he's a thinking's man's fighter. Everything is very high ring IQ. He sees it coming. So Charles's reckless approach of just making this a crazy throwdown, maybe not going to work as much against Benil Diriush. Talking about underrated power, Benil's got the underrated power. This guy's got a nasty liver kick, trained under Rafael Cordero for a decade. He's a very good striker, underrated guy, and he catches it with those shots you don't quite see. He's uh, very precise. That's not good against, or that's great against Charles Oliveira, who head straight up in the air, leaves tons of openings. Benil will be able to hurt him. Benil's got more than enough wrestling to score takedowns, and unlike a lot of Charles Oliveira past opponents, Benil can actually grapple with him. He's a high-level BJJ black belt. He does his best work from on top. If he wants Charles on the ground, he's going to be on top. He can ground and pound him. He can beat him standing. I just feel like he's got a whole lot of ways to win this fight, probably inside the distance. So I think the main thing is this fight's not going the distance, right? Charles pulls one out. He's going to finish Benil Dariush, which I would not rule out of the realm of possibility. But I got to go with the more like consistent and refined skill set. And even though Benil Dariush looks like Steve Martin these days, like hair is going all the way white. Uh, he's still not old. He's still not shot. He's still got a lot of ways to go. And I think Benil Dariush pulls this one off. So pains me. Absolutely pains me, but I got to go with Benil. I wouldn't be stunned if this goes to decision, to be perfectly honest. Um, you, you said one interesting thing there. And if he's a thinking man's fighter, is he even going to bot? Like, I know he's got great jujitsu in his own right. And it's really tough if you're high level to just get caught with something like from guard. So maybe he does go for takedowns and, and take Charles Oliveira down, put himself into the fire because he's like, this guy, as long as I maintain control in these positions, I'm not going to get myself in trouble. But, like, I wouldn't be stunned if Din, uh, if Darius fights this really, really slow pace, fights it very, very, you know, minds his P's and Q's, and this fight is ends up being a little bit more boring than we expect. Um I do struggle to get to Charles. It's not It's not because of Islam Makachev. Makachev was able to take him down, went right down into the fire that everyone thought that he wasn't willing to go into, and uh, and then submitted him, which, I mean, nobody was calling it, especially after the run that Charles Oliveira was on. But I do side with you. I, I ever so slightly lean towards Benil Darius just on the, on the fact that I think he's got a little bit more technical, uh, solid technical striking. Um... And he fights a very, very smart approach. Charles Oliveira could do crazy things early to him, but once Benil kind of susses out the situation, I think he'll 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 kind of take over, find where he's got the advantage, and, and go from there. It's not a fight I'm going to be betting. I, I am kind of interested in uh, on Prize Picks under 
1.5 takedowns for Benil Dariush. Um, See, I, I'm thinking the over, and I the reason I'm know. thinking on that, yeah, that's great, good thinking. Like you said, why would you want to go to the ground with Charles Oliveira? But Benil wants to go to the ground with anybody because he knows he's got legitimate skills. His rematch with Carlos Diego Ferreira, like Carlos Diego Ferreira is a third degree Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, five takedowns for Benil Dariush. Benil Dariush versus Tony Ferguson, his very next fight. Nobody wants to go to the ground with Tony Ferguson. Hey, Tony versus Khabib would be a good fight because what's Khabib going to do to him? Benil was the original guy that like flat out exposed him. That's like, oh, Tony can't do shit off his back. That's right. I don't think he's worried. Like the perception of these great grapplers, like it's 2023. You don't want to be on your back. That's the bottom line. Sure. Oh, I took down Charles Oliveira. What, what's he worried about? The armbar? The triangle choke? For real? Is that what you're worried about? Nah, you're worried about shit like the guillotine, the dars, like him taking your back and looking for a rear naked, like offensive him getting on top of you moves. Not, I took the guy down, I passed his guard, and we're sitting here. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Sometimes I am. Many times I am. We'll come see Saturday. I would feel good if Charles won as a fan. I would not feel good as a better because, unfortunately, I'm laying the money against him. All right, this next fight, Cody, has my favorite prize picks play of the week. We got Mike Malat taking on Adam Fugit. Uh, Mike Malat is a minus two hundred five favorite. Fugit can be had for plus one seventy five. Malat's got a, a one and a half takedown number here, which is like I'm not sure he's the better wrestler out of the two of these two uh, out of these two guys. In his three UFC fights with stats, he's only ever got to one takedown. Uh, Mickey Gall obviously took him down. Um, and then the other two fights, one was on Contender Series. The other one was against Johan Lainess. A lot of the times his fights ended up uh, finishing quite early. I know he's been in the media saying that it's like, he's like, I've got three-round cardio. It's just it's, I've been finding the finish. I've been finding the way to uh, to get her done a lot faster. He's like, but I'm, I'm able to go the full 15 minutes. Um I like Milan here, but I think it's more of the fact that like he has advantages on the feet that he's good that he's going to uh, to dominate in this fight. Um, I don't really think he tries to wrestle whatsoever with Fugit. Uh, what, what's your take here? Yeah, I'm actually going to agree with that. I think the great thing about uh, Mike Milan, and he's been around the Canadian scene for a long time. He's kind of like known as that next breakout Canadian star. And when you look at how this card's placed, like who's the big Canadian on the card? We're in Canada. You know, this is a main card spot. I think they're looking at Mike Milan to be the next guy that could jump through it, at least challenge that top 15 talent. But he's good because he's super well-rounded. He can wrestle. He's got a high-level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And as well, he's a good striker. But again, a thinking man's fighter, very smart kid. And if you know him or if you've spoken to him in real life, like he's doing some broadcasting stuff now. Uh, very, very bright young man. I think he sees the path here, which is not exert too much energy trying to wrestle with Fugit, who's pretty rugged and a fairly big body as well at this weight class. I think we'd be use that speed advantage to the outside and just try to hit him with that big shot. His fight with Michael Morales, Morales hits him with just kind of a, I mean, listen, it's a big shot, no doubt about it, but he tired, he was on short notice, he found his chin, wrestling wasn't really working in that fight, you know, props he was it was a decent debut i think he showed me a lot even though he got finished and i should have bet him against that yusaku kinoshida because he didn't look terrible in a debut loss and then comes out against kinoshida and just absolutely wrecks him top to bottom so the one worry with mike and i've expressed this in the past as well is that i think seven of his last eight fights have ended in the first round the one fight that didn't end in the first round was his fight with thomas diang way back in like a bellator prelim where uh, he 10 8 to Diang in the first round and then lost the second and third. So he tired in that fight once it got out of the first. Now, you can say you got cardio all days, and most guys believe they got cardio. You're not fighting in the UFC if you don't think you got cardio, but it's a different level of cardio having to fight in the second round into the third round. It's a pay-per-view main card. The crowd's going nuts. They're all there for you. There's an adrenaline dump. You broke your hand. Those are all like the variables that cause you to fatigue wake faster than you would when you're in the gym working with you know the confounds of your training partners and your regular coaches and you know in a controlled atmosphere so i'm not questioning his cardio i'm just saying as you know as a capper it's hard to say that the guy's got great cardio you know exceptional cardio can go 15 minutes strong when you haven't really seen him do it at least not recently so i will bet him as well um just feel reluctant on it like i i part of me thinks that adam fugit is being overlooked a little bit i overlooked him personally in his last fight he actually looked pretty good. The kid's like six foot one with a 77 inch reach. 
Naturally, he is the bigger man, I think. He can wrestle, maybe has that wrestling advantage, as you mentioned. It's just he's too clunky with his stand-up game. He's too much, I need to break you down and you fatigue so I can get a hold of you. Not great footwork, doesn't move great laterally, doesn't move his head, doesn't have great counter punching. And so I just feel like Mike probably touches him at some point. And if he goes down and Mike ends up on his back, well, it's over with the submission. If he doesn't, then Mike just minds his P's and Q's from the outside and chips away all day long. So I will take Mike Malad as well, but a uh, bit of hesitancy. This is a good fight. It's actually well matched. Yeah. Um. Per per UFC stats, they're the same height, which actually kind of surprised me. I thought Fug- Fuga was a little bit taller. Uh, but Fuga's got a four inch reach advantage um, in terms of their size. But I mean, these stats sometimes are all over the place until you actually see them standing next to each other. You don't really have much of a, a good read on that. Moving on down, we've got an Fuga, absolute. Yeah. Oh. yeah Fuga, I was, the last thing I was going to say is that Fuga's entire career has been at 170. Mike Malott used to fight at 145 and then moved to 155. Now fights at 170. So I. I, I yeah, we'll have to see the next of the scales to see like how structure and frame looks. But I'm expecting Fuga to just be a, a more dense guy all around. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on down, we've got uh, Banger. Absolute Banger, Banger Alert. This would be a great fight on any card. Uh, Dan Ige takes on Nate, the train, Landweir. Minus 250 for Dan Ige, plus 210 for Nate Landweir. I'm just hoping that this fight lives up to the hype, that it's just like the absolute you know, fireworks that we would expect from these two guys. Uh, Ige obviously had a pretty tough run, um, but he was game matched up against some of the division's elite. Chan Sung Jung was a very, very competitive fight. Uh, I mean, he was competitive in there with tons of really, really top-level guys. Uh, obviously, Movsar was able to take him down nine times, neutralize him hit there. That's not really something that I would expect in a fight with Nate, Tra- uh, Nate the Train. Um, and then, I mean, going arguably arguably beat Josh Emmett who was you know a title contender so he went in there had a really really tough run and then kind of showed us you know in Damon Jackson kind of showed us that there's levels it's like he he had he had went on a three fight losing streak but you put him in there against somebody who's outside of the top 15 and and he can he can do some serious damage Nate the trade like Here's the thing. Minus 250, I don't necessarily love that price, but it's like when I look at these two guys, I think I see massive edges for uh, Dan Ige in terms of, you know, the the power of the strikes that he delivers. There's an advantage for Nate Nate Landwehr in the wrestling department, I would say. But I think the biggest question mark here, and if this fight turns into an absolute slobber knocker, is um, our producer, uh, Megan Earmuffs, it's a little bit of like positive racism here again. He's Hawaiian. Danny Gay is Hawaiian. Hawaiians don't get knocked out. Um, I think that's really what it comes down to is durability off the charts for Ige. And we've seen with Landwehr in the uh, in the fight with Julian Arosa. It's like he can get wobbled, particularly if he's taking big shots. Uh, I took Dan Ige. By knockout plus two oh five, which I believe is still out there on the market right now. It's on the move in other at other books. I expect it to be more like plus one fifty. Um, that's how I see the fight playing out, and I'm like plus two hundred seems like a good good time. So let's get in while the getting's good. Uh, Dan Ige by knockout round two would be my 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 total guess. But uh, what, how do you see this one shaking out? Yeah, maybe that's part of the reason I was a little bit sour at the top of the show about this card is I got two boys and I think they're both in for bad nights, man. Like I, I think that Nate Land, where Nate the Train baby is, uh, this is not a particularly great matchup for him. When he fights really low level competition, he fights them very low level. When he fights high level competition, he fights them high level. It's just like he's so looking for this fight of the night. You know, it's a crazy brawl. He wants to stay in your face. He wants to throw down that he does not do what's right. He does not look two moves ahead and and he gets himself caught. He debuted against uh, Herbert Burns, also Mm -hmm. known as an absolute bum, right? It's Gilbert's brother, but oh my God, is he ever trash? And I talk a whole lot of shit about Nate Landwehr, who's coming off a run in Russia where he had defeated all these badass Russian guys, all O-V-E-V last names, won the M1 title, comes to the UFC and runs himself head first into a knee to get himself KO'd. First time he ever been knocked out. So I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? Second fight in the UFC, a crazy fight was his Darren Elkins. He got outstruck, 121 to like 111. 
in a purely stand-up fight with Darren Elkins. Darren Elkins outstruck him, and there was actually people that were sour online that they thought Elkins won afterwards. So, like, bad move. Then against Julian Arosa, who's got no durability, he proceeds to last 59 seconds and gets booted lopsided the head and falls down. So I think people are writing him off without realizing that these crazy action, all action guys, they're, they can win, right? But similar to Charles Oliveira, like you got to get up from those couple of knockdowns. You got to go through the fire. You got to come through the other side. And him versus the David Onama, the infamous fight that led to the, 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 the literally the downfall of James Krause. He did exactly that. Onama come at him early. It's that when you tire and you still leave Nate there. Yeah, he's a good athlete. He's got a very deep gas tank. He's capable of pushing a pace. He's a wild man. And if he thinks he can win the fight, he's going to be fighting for it. And so Onama was able to tire down. That was a huge win for him. Okay, You go right from that to Austin Lingo. And he soundly loses the first round to Austin Lingo. What is going on here? So the guy, like, is he world class or is he just a dirty junkyard dog that's capable of giving rounds to some of the best guys? I'm thinking the latter. And the couple problems that he's going to have here with Dan Ige is, one, Dan Ige is not going to tire. Dan Ige does not tire. He's got endless cardio. The guy that can push a pace as well. Guy that has fought deep into fights before. He went five rounds at Calvin Cater in a fight where Calvin Cater outstruck him 105-84. Uh, the fight was 4-1 as well. Ige, I think, won the second or the third round, but... All the same, it's like he, he's got that five-round experience. His other losses, Korean Zombie, Josh Emmett, Movzar Evloev. So he's a gatekeeper to the stars. He's not just a gatekeeper. He's losing the top five talent. And in all of those guys, decision, 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 decision. He didn't really gas out. Or he's fighting the best guys. Maybe he's a little hurt. Maybe he's a little tired. But it's very understandable. Him versus Nate Landwehr, just coming forward and trying to scrap with him is not simply going to get it done. And so for that reason, if Nate can't grind him down and slow him down to his pace, it's going to be problems for him. Second thing is Nate, for as explosive as he is and a good athlete, guy that ran some high-level track and field back in the day, he's not that fast, man. And Dan Ige's best thing about him is he's fast. He's got wicked fast hands. His Gavin Tucker fight, Gavin Tucker did not see those punches coming. Don't remember them still to this day, but he's got very quick hand speed. And you see that last fight with Damon Jackson, it's much of the same. When you think of Dan Ige, you don't think of big power. Oh, this guy's not knocking out, guys. Yeah, but look who he fights. He's fighting Mavzar Evolev. He's fighting Korean Zombies. fighting Calvin Cater. Oh, he's got no knockout power. Whenever they give him that little step below, he thrives in those spots. Quick hand speed, good combinations, trains in Las Vegas, some of the best guys, state champion wrestler in Hawaii, high school level. So wrestling's not elite, but good enough to keep the fight standing against most opponents. And I think that'll be it. Nate's not even want to shoot a whole lot of takedowns. He's trying to go out there and brawl and have a fun fight and... I feel like Ige is just way too fast, stay to the outside, better cardio, clips him at some point, puts him over. So I'd love to see an Ige decision so that Nate don't get hurt too bad, but I can still win some money. But like my gut's telling me Ige is going to knock him out at some point. All right, we move on down. We've got Mark andre Barrio taking on Eric Anders, minus 135 for Barrio, plus 115 for Eric Anders. Who you got here, buddy? Yeah, so this will come down to what Paul was saying earlier at the top of the hour. Apologizes for bad judging. I don't think Mark andre Barrio needs bad judging to win this fight, but this fight's going to be a bog. It's going to be very close. It's going to be very competitive. You'll be able to make a strong case for either guy having won it, and then the judges will give it to Mark andre Barrio because that ever so slightly, he's the Canadian guy. It's just the way it probably should go down. When you look at Anders, no fault to him. You know, we, we've talked about this at this point. He's a, He's been a bust in terms of, you know, he wins a national championship in college as a football player. He's a great athlete, comes over to the UFC, and then just never really evolved his game. Like, as an LFA champion, there was more wrinkles to his game that you see at the UFC level. But, of course, you know, fought Leo Machida for five rounds in Brazil, has fought some high-profile fights, has accrued that experience, and, you know, seems to be making some improvements. A move down to fight-ready MMA, that definitely helped him a little bit. But again, he's just so inconsistent. His first fight with Darren Stewart, he smokes him. Career best. Gets himself nearly disqualified, settles for no contest. But an immediate rematch to Darren Stewart, he falls flat on his face and damn near loses. So you just you can't trust him. You can never trust him. Even though this is an even money fight, Eric Anders is not someone I want to back up. Looked great in his last fight, for the record. Comes out there against uh, Doukas, clips him, puts him away. Looks solid, good shape, always in good shape. And does have heavy hands. But that win is like a second knockout win in the UFC. Like he doesn't, for the most part, maybe his third win. I think he beat Vinicius Moreira and, uh, oh man, who's the guy he booted in the face as he was trying to get up? Tim Williams. 
So, so yeah, like he's not a big, big power puncher by the numbers in the UFC. He seems to be an explosive athlete. He seems to be able to land, but it seems like every Eric Anders fight ends the exact same way in the clinch. He just relies too heavily on his clinch approach, bullying his opponent up to the cage. And unfortunately with Marc-Andre Barrio, he kind of thrives. His best position is the clinch. He's not a great wrestler. He's not a great striker. He's a willing striker. But he does his best work in the clinch, I think, wearing on his opponents, working the body, landing those short little shots. And Barrio can fight for 15 full minutes. So Eric Anders and Barrio will probably be competitive in the early going. A lot of clinch fighting. As Anders starts to slow a little bit, I feel like Barrio will pull through just a little, little bit more. In the third round, it should be Barrio's. Again, this would be a close competitive fight. People will probably argue it online. But the judges will side with Marc-Andre Barrio, given the decision to him. So I'll take Barrio by decision. I'm taking Barrio as well. I think it really comes down to the volume. Um, this is a guy that, you know, in two rounds against Julian Marquez, 109 significant strikes, uh, Dalka, who was trying, I don't see this fight being too different from like the Dalka fight. Dalka was going out yeah. there and, and shooting takedowns. And that's where like, I think Eric Anders is going, he's going to have to make it ugly. He's ha- going to have to secure some takedowns and hold position. I'm just not confident in what I've seen from his wrestling that he's going to be able to go out there and take Mark andre Barrio down consistently and hold him down. That's the real key here. Um, so I'm with you. I like Mark andre Barrio to win by decision on prize picks. Um, I like the 63 and a half significant strikes could look very, very easy for him. Uh, Anders does have a tendency to slow down his opponents, slow down his fights. The totals don't tend to go off the charts like that, but he's typically pretty durable able to stick in there for 15 minutes and Mark Andre Barrio to get over 63 and a half significant strikes in 15 minutes. Seems like a pretty good, good, pretty good side to me. So that's where my head's at on this one. We move on down. Oh my God. Cody's other boy uh, is taking on Nasruddin Imovov. Chris Curtis, the action man. Is this the other guy that you're saying that is in for a bad night code? Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, the old action man's in for a rough night. But listen, he's capable of winning this fight. It's just going to be like every other action man fight. He's going to lose the first round, almost guarantee he loses the first round, and live bet him some point in the second and hope that he just turns up the volume or that he clips him at some point. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's tough for Chris Curtis, right? You jump into the UFC, you're 33 years old, right? So he just tries to fight as much as he can. And I feel like that's going to actually be his downfall. So this fight with Nasruddin Imovov is his fifth fight in the last 12 months. In those five fights, I wanted to write this down. He's been hit 319 significant times. Sorry, four, because this is his fifth fight. So in four fights, which is the span of 12 months, not very long, Paul, he's been landed on 319 significant times in his fights. Not to mention the fact that he's training for these fights. Not to mention the fact that he spars hard for all of his training for these fights. Not to mention the fact that his chief sparring partner is Sean Strickland, who's an idiot. And lights up sparring partners. Yeah, so to me, it just seems like he's taken a lot of damage. And and now his game plan is like completely reverted from what it used to be. When he's fighting on the regional scene, when he first came in, it was all about volume. He's trying to out-volume his opponent. Now he's just trying to Philly shell and let you punch yourself out. And it's been working to a certain extent. But man, he's getting whipped by Phil Hawes before he lands the shot and puts him away. Mm -hmm. He's getting whipped by Joaquin Buckley before he lands the shots and puts him away. And then in the Gastelum fight, when Gastelum didn't go away, it was like, oh man, I got to fight him back. Now, could he have won that fight without the headbutt in the second? Yes, because it was a 1-1 fight. Gastelum won the first. Action Man won the third. It was second round was going Action Man's way. That headbutt changes everything. So a win over Gastelum would have been huge for him. Um, But instead, it's like he just, he goes online, he complains. He wants a rematch versus Kelvin Gastelum. I want to fight as quick as possible. And now you get a quick turnaround versus Nasser Dean Imovov. I don't know if he plans to fight these guys. I don't know if he looks into these guys or if he just accepts whoever's on the dotted line. But I don't think he's doing himself any favor by just going from fight to fight to fight. He looked to me damaged against Calvin Gaslam. He tired, which you don't usually see from him. He got seriously banged up. He's hurt to the body. He's hurt to the head. He's got both hands by his hip with his mouth wide open, staring at him. And that's supposed to be his best round in that third round. Wasn't a very good performance from him. And then to jump from that two months later, right back into another fight, overlooking Imovov and still calling out Calvin Gaslam, flying all the way to Canada to fight on a prelim, like it's not going to go good for him, man. It's not. And so here's what I like about Imovov. Imovov's got bad cardio, which is why a guy like Chris Curtis would be a, you know, a nice looking pick against him. But that's a five-round fight you got to look at Nasruddin Imovov gassing out in. 
He himself gassed out against Hawes a long time ago. I thought he gassed out a little bit against Joaquin Buckley, you know, 15-minute fight. Against Sean Strickland, he flat out gasses out. We all think he's got bad cardio, and then he flat out gasses out. But one, it's a five-round fight to which he survived all 25 minutes, which I think will be good for him going forward. Second of all, the fight was weird. It got scrapped last minute. He's supposed to fight Calvin Gastelum at 185 pounds. Sean Strickland takes the fight on like four days notice, five mm-hmm. days notice, right? And then and then Imovov weighs in at 195. Mm-hmm. Sean Strickland weighs in at 205. He floated him 10 pounds and took on a completely different opponent in a 25-minute fight. So yeah, I'm going to give him a pass, dude. I'm going to give him a pass. <laughs> what I can tell you is he's really good from the outside. They call him the sniper for a reason. He moves laterally. He's got a long jab. He's got a nice right hand on him, and he moves well from the outside. He's not going to stand in the pocket and brawl with you. That's what uh, Chris Curtis needs. Chris Curtis needs someone who's going to stand right in front of him because when Buckley was at range, he toasted him. When Jack Hermanson sat at range, no non-competitive fight for Chris Curtis because he can't cut the cage off. He does not deal with guys that are faster than him, that are going to stand to the outside and have a big cage to work with. He relies on these guys that are slower with bad cardio that'll stand in the pocket. So he's not getting that. And then in terms of, we'll wait until the kid gasses out. It's only a three-round fight. Mm -hmm. If you wait too long, which he often does, and you lose those first two rounds, well, who cares if you win the third? The same thing will happen to you in the Kelvin Gastelum fight. It's just too little too late. So speed advantage, youth advantage, gets 27. You don't think he's getting better? I think he's getting better. He's coming off a a five-round fight. He's got some experience under his belt now. He's learned some lessons from that. And I think he just stays at the outside and, and, and paints a picture. So as much as I do love action, man, this is just like just accepting any fight that comes your way is not necessarily the best thing going. He did the same thing as Jack Romanson. He just took the fight. Ah, whatever. Who cares? Sean fought this guy and beat him. So I'll fight him. Yeah, well, this is the same thing here. Sean fought this guy and beat him. Sean was 205 pounds when he fought this guy. I don't know. I, I love Chris Chris. Don't get me wrong. But again, it's like just because you like a guy doesn't mean you think he's going to win a fight. So would I be pleasantly surprised? Sure. Right. But. Kind of want to make that money, so I, I need the action man to go down at least one time here. Yeah, I hate that I agree with you, but I do. Um, my biggest struggle with with Curtis is, is a lot of the times the volume and the fact that yeah, that Hermanson fight, just not being able to get into the pocket, not being able to exchange, and then like getting so frustrated with that and like blaming him for running. But it's like, I mean, we're gonna be on at a pay per view. Big cage um, is always I like any of these times that they go to like a major, a major city like Vancouver. Um, there's gonna be a lot of lot of room for Nasruddin Imovov to stay at range, wait for Chris Curtis to try to walk him down and and pick him off and continue to move. So I'm with you. I'm I'm, I'm picking Imovov, but I couldn't I I couldn't I couldn't bet against our guy, uh, Chris Curtis with my actual money. So. That that's where I stand on this one. Moving on down, we got uh, Miranda Maverick taking on Jasmine Jasudovicius. Minus three hundred for Maverick, plus two forty five for Double J. Who you got? Yeah, I mean, I, they didn't really give Canada these great matchups, dude. So so in terms of Jasmine Jasudovicius, yeah, again, fan of her work. I think that she's a very hardworking, gritty fighter, like watching her fights. It's just a tough matchup for her. How does she win this fight? So first of all, Jasmine at her best, she likes to employ some of that wrestling. She likes to lean on her opponents. I don't think she has a wrestling advantage over Miranda Maverick. I don't think she has her typical clinch advantage that she has over a lot of opponents over Miranda Maverick. She's tall. She's lanky. She generates a lot of leverage, just like her head coach, her, her boyfriend, Chris Prickett, right? They're they have that long frame, right? They generate tons of leverage. They're good wrestlers. But Miranda Maverick is just ripped up, short, stocky, and very powerful. So I just don't see her wrestling being a factor here. And I don't think her clinch game will be a factor here. In terms of the striking, Jasmine J- Jesse DeVisius is a is a just scrap kind of fighter. Let's throw down. Doesn't move her feet. Doesn't move her head. Wants to stand in the pocket. Wants to exchange. Wants you to throw back. Whereas Miranda Maverick's just fleet-footed. You know, she's in and out of the pocket. She loves leading with the kicks. She likes hitting her opponent with a quick one-two, jumping back out of range. So I think Jasmine's just going to deal. She's going to have a trouble dealing with the speed advantage, the distance management for the large part in terms of it being standing. She'll struggle to get a wrestling going. And I just don't think that she's going to be able to hold Mra- Miranda Maverick up against the cage for long periods of time. So yeah, minus 300 Maverick does not seem very appealing. But to me, she's got advantages pretty much wherever. Like it's if it just stays as a stand-up battle, she should double her up on the striking numbers, bob in and out, touch her, get out of there, use the leg kicks, and uh, just frustrate her for the most part. 
if it ends up being a wrestling match or a grappling match, I feel like Miranda Maverick's got the advantage. She can score takedowns. She could end up on top. She could use it to win rounds. She could use it to set up some ground and pound to persuade the judges. But she just got different ways to go out there and win this fight. So I would have to say Miranda Maverick, who's not a finisher by no stretch, and Jasmine's rock solid durable. Uh, durable. So fight goes the distance. And if the judges are really bad in BC, maybe it's a, a bad decision for Jasmine. But outside of like a questionable judge's decision, um, I just feel like Miranda Maverick has her beat. The number's going to back that up. Minus 300. Most people probably expect her to get the job done. I mean, fight goes to decision is probably like minus 400. The over two and a half rounds is minus 355. <laughs> Maverick, and and that all leads me to why I think on over on prize picks, 45.5 significant strikes for Maverick over. I mean, you go through like a lot of her previous fights and it's Shanna Young. She was able to get five takedowns, but she had 63 significant strikes there. Um, you know, lost to Blanchfield, so obviously she goes way under. If she wins this fight and doesn't get a finish, if this goes to decision, like Macy Barber even, she lost, but she got... 47 oh, significant no. strikes. Miranda Maverick uh, against Jillian Robertson, 71 significant strikes. It could be really, really close and tight. Like, I'm not saying that this is like lock it in, but 45.5 seems like a number that'll probably be at least 50 uh, by Saturday. So I've been adding it to some tickets over on prize picks, but like, you know, I'm not locking it in. It's not going to make or break my week. Uh, I'm with you. I think M Maverick's able to secure takedowns, just use that physicality. And win a decision. Uh, maybe Canada screws her. But, uh, you know, as long as she gets over 40, 45.5 significant strikes, I'll be a happy man. Uh, moving on down, we got Eamon Zahabi taking on Aori Kilang. Uh, it's pretty much a straight pick. Um, the line that I put on the on the board has minus 115 for Kilang, minus 105 for Zahabi. What are your thoughts here, buddy? I don't like it for Zahabi that he's just rushing back in there. 11 months. Like, that's quick for Zahabi's standards, man. He likes generally taking 16, 18, maybe two years if he can squeeze it. But uh, yeah, it just doesn't compete all that often, Paul. And the same problems I have with him are always the same problems I have with him. At wrestling, really not all that good. Counter puncher, low volume, seems to have low power, just kind of stares. As an amateur, didn't want to fight anybody good. The early beginning of his pro career, purposely fought... The worst available guys finishes six guys in the first round, comes to the UFC, and it's been bad. He robbed Reginaldo Vieira in a fight that I think was in Ottawa, so hometown, and uh, just looked awful against like a very low level, primitive ultimate fighter winner from Brazil who's already in his mid 30s. So, right off the get go, bad taste in my mouth. The Ricardo Ramos fight, terrible fight. It's one on one going into the third. He could win this fight, and he walks head first into a spinning back elbow. I say head first because the first one missed by like a mile. He's seen it, and then he went straight into a second one. So I don't know. Then Vince Morales, of all people, outpoints him. So he's a complete bust. He's a write-off. And I will never bet a cent on Eamon Zahabi ever again. And then he goes out there and he torches Draco Rodriguez. And then he goes out there and he torches Ricky Tercio. So as much as I say he doesn't have any power, and I don't think he does have a ton of power, coming off back-to-back -back knockout wins. And so he's kind of made me eat a little bit of crow. You can't disrespect anybody. You can't overlook anybody. Eamon's a hobby. At least he has the luxury with his brother being Faraz and being in a mega gym that, you know, he probably has coaches catered to him. He probably has training partners around him. They're probably spending a lot of time getting this guy ready, but I never really thought he was like a fighter because he wanted to be a fighter. He was a fighter because he could. He makes money outside of the cage. He's got a family. He goes to the gym. He trains people and gets personals and, and he fights once every 16 or 18 months just for the hell of it. Right. So they're on Canadian soil. Even though he just dusted Tercios, sorry, he never knocked him out. It was a decision. Bad fight. Terrible fight. Ricky fought the worst fight going, but I don't know, man. It's just not enough for me. It's never been enough for me. So how does he fight a Richie Lang? Well, a Richie Lang is kind of more primitive. He's going to come forward and he's going to just try to berserk charge him. He's going to let his hands go. He is a power puncher and he's there to get hit. So if eamon has got some nice power, if eamon has got some nice counters, then maybe he clips him, sure. But a Richie Lang can take one hell of a punch and I think him coming forward and just constantly going on those blitzes, constantly just trying to trying to put up actual volume, try to put up actual numbers, just try to actually outwork them, I think it's going to pay dividends. So Hobby could kind of flip up the game and take him down. That's been the way to beat a Richie Lang, take the guy down. But again, you never see the kid use his wrestling. I don't think his wrestling is all that good. 
So I'm just waiting for Zahabi to make me look like an idiot again. But uh, again, cannot bet this guy. I think Arichi Lang will just do enough to persuade the judges. And if this fight took place in any other jurisdiction than Canada, it would be a, a unanimous decision win for Arichi Lang. But uh, you could see it getting greasy, of course, on Canadian soil. Maybe it's a split. Maybe I get screwed on a bad decision. But I still just got to pick who I think is the better guy. And I think a Richie Lang style should uh, should win this fight. I, I am with you, but I will correct you because you said that uh, Eamon's a hobby. The back-to-back -back knockouts? Back-to-back -back yeah. knockouts? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, yeah, I Chris pulled was a decision. I, it was a decision. And a mm. horrible decision where nobody got close to getting finished. I just pulled up like a tweet because I knew... It rang a bell in the back of my head. I'm like, I think I complained about this on Twitter. I said, well, at least Vanderov uh, versus Sherman should be unintentionally hilarious. Zahabi slash Tercios just stole 20 minutes of our lives. Um, yeah, no, that fight sucked. That was horrible. But Zahabi, and that was the thing, is that we went into that fight kind of thinking, like, Tercios should be able to volume him. Uh, volume. Uh, Zahabi, Zahabi, you know, it's like a 50 significant strike kind of guy. It's like that's most of his fights kind of play out that way. Mine's just P's and Q's. Very, very quick to retreat. Um, He's not even 50. Like 44 versus Reginaldo Vieira yeah. over 15. Well, it's his debut, you know. 46 over Ricardo Ramos. Well, it didn't quite make it the whole 15 minutes. The Vince Morales fight, he lands 28. He does nothing. He just stands there. He stares at him. And so just by numbers, if you have fight metric up, you'll see he averages 3.01 strikes per minute, right? And compared to a Richie Lang's 6.07, he's flat out getting doubled up here. That's and it's it's, a, it's not, Tercios is a one fight pint size sample. Oh, yo, he beat one kid, right? Uh, this, this is the hobby six fights. You kind of know what you're going to get out of him, which is sub 50, and a Richie Lang, the guy goes for it, and that's got to count for something, which is why I'm picking him. But I fully expect this one to be greasy, and it'll be way lower on the tickets this week. Yeah. No, no, I'm I'm with you. I, I like that side. I like it because of volume. But Canada, hashtag sorry gif, uh, is very, very much in play. Uh, we got Blake Builder taking on Kyle Nelson. Minus 240 for Blake Builder, plus 200 for Kyle Nelson. Who you got here? Yeah, I think you live bet Blake Builder because there is a chance he gets absolutely knocked out in the first round. No doubt about it. This kid's undefeated. He's never been knocked out, but like he's waiting to get knocked out, man. He's been hurt a bunch of his fights. He's been dropped in a bunch of his fights. Defensively, very shaky. Doesn't move his head. And I just don't think he can take that great of a punch, truth be told. So the way he's been winning, um, at least him and his best, is he's got a good gas tank, man. Got good gas tank. He's got decent enough striking where he can land the one-two consistently, move out of range, hopefully not get hit with that big haymaker of a shot, but he's decent enough wrestling, good submission skills. He himself is a good prototypical fighter. It's just I'm super worried about him getting starched in the first round against probably most guys. And his fight with Shane Young, kind of most, much of the same. That first round was like, oh, Builder might get his head taken off. As soon as he was able to kind of outlast him, Second and the third round, all day. I think that's what happens here. Kyle Nelson starts off his career in the UFC at 145 pounds. Realizes weight cuts too much. Who's up to 155? He's big. He's strong. He's thick. And his striking has been coming a long way. Works with Crew Alin, Mike Malott's coach. And in fact, for my money's worth, I think the best coach in Canada. Uh, he's got proven results. He's taken guys from nothing and gotten them to the highest level of kickboxing, MMA, you name it, right? The guy's a legitimately good coach. And he's worked with Kyle Nelson for a long time. So no doubt about it that the kid's striking has gotten a lot better. And you do see that from fight to fight. Two things that haven't gotten any better whatsoever is uh, is cardio. His cardio just doesn't really seem to ever get up to the level it needs to be for a 15-minute level fight. And uh, his wrestling, you've got good uh, kickboxing to rely on, but you've got to also use that strength and physicality to slow your opponents down, make them carry your weight, kind of drag them into those deeper waters. But without that wrestling, without that clinch work, without that cardio... There just leaves something to be desired for sure. Now he goes out there and he gives everybody a go. He's got heart of a lion. He pushes through bad spots. His last number of opponents were all good guys. Duho choice, solid, right? Forces a draw with him. Jay Herbert loses the fight to Jay Herbert. Watch it back, man. Strong argument. Kyle Nelson won that fight. Uh, before that, Billy Quarantillo, you know, another guy that's a top 15, top 10 ish type contender. So it's no disrespect to Kyle Nelson. It's just uh, they're not the kind of guys that I like to bet. Big first round, needs to knock you out in the first round, might rock you in the first round. 
but then tires and accepts positions. Not not great. So against Blake Builder, yeah, he's live to knock him out in the first round. No doubt about it. If he does not get it, which I don't think he will, I think Blake's going to take him down. I think Blake's going to start leaning on him. I think Blake's just going to out-volume, beat him to the punch, use those one-twos, stay to the outside, and just constantly make him work. So, yeah, Kyle Nelson must realize this could be the last fight on his deal. This could be his last hurrah. They've booked him in Canada. They've booked him in a fight that he should be winning or at least the type of level of fight that they're not going to give you much lower than this. So it's like time for him to go out there and show up. I bet you he's going to be in great shape. He's got Diana Belbita and Mike Malott, both training partners of his on the card, whole coaching staff, whole team's going to go down. He'll put his best foot forward and he can get that win. And that's why I don't think I want to bet Blake Builder other than my PRP tickets, and all that stuff. I don't really want to bet him all that heavy pre-fight. I want to see that first round because he could lose the first round. I'll bet him after the first and get a much better price on him. And if he gets starched in the first round well nah, i don't really care right i mean i do care because i have him on parlays but it wouldn't be like i put a one singular big pre-fight bet on him at minus 250 and then watch him get lamped in the first I, I, that i don't want so better pre-fight bet i think and then overall he is the pick yeah i mean the the duho Choi uh draw was really only because of the headbutt and it was like the softest headbutt I mean, it's still a foul, but like taking a point there when the decision of that fight is on the line seemed like incredibly bad. Um, it was one of those cards. I think well, it was well, the Dana. Dana paid Duho Choi his win bonus and did not pay Kyle Nelson his exactly without the point, and it was a cheap point deduction. He loses, but he did legitimately win a round against Duho Choi, which had, I think is impressive he enough. Five, he had five takedowns, and he was able to stick to that wrestling game plan. I don't think that wrestling game plan is anywhere in sight against builder who i think is the much better wrestler out of the two of them i actually and i i don't even have clv on i parlayed the under two and a half rounds with uh over in maria Oliveira versus belbita later down the card because i think we see the old kyle nelson kind of show back up here i think he comes out there like a freight train like he did against carlos diego ferreira uh in toronto way back when and comes out there, tries to get the finish early, and, you know, he either gets her done or or dies mm -hmm. trying. Um, that's kind of how I see this fight playing out. So I was kind of surprised. And I'm surprised that, like, I think that the total, like, Kyle Nelson was a guy that we were always constantly betting unders in, in, like, every single one of his fights. Now, you know, he goes to decision against Duho Choi, and that whole script is kind of flipped. I, I could totally see, I mean, I bet it. Oh, uh, I could totally see this fight going under the two and a half rounds. Um, it covers you on a lot of different bases. It covers you on Kyle Nelson getting finished or, or gassing out and getting finished. It covers you on Kyle Nelson landing a big bomb early. I'm kind of surprised that the under two and a half rounds is still like minus two, uh, minus one four. I think it was minus one sixty on the parlor that I made. So it's like, in terms of what the market the market move is saying, I, I made a bad bet there. But uh, I, I see this one being finished in like the first seven and a half minutes to be perfectly honest. So, um, and you got a big crowd there. Like a lot of these other fights have been taking place at the apex. There's like 27 people in the building. It's like you get a full crowd in Canada, like, you know, the, uh, the Carlos Diego Ferreira fight that he went out there like a bat out of hell looking for a finish and then died in the process. Like he had a hell of a first round against Car Carlos Diego Ferreira. And then you can kind of see it's like if he puts that type of pace on you, he kept the pace way down low against Duho Choi and got bailed out by that point to get a draw. But if he puts that pace on you early, he doesn't have 15-minute cardio. Now, and especially at 145 pounds, I'm even less confident that he's got 15 minutes of cardio. So I think Blake Builder wins. I think big Blake Builder Round two, round three props could be interesting, but I like the under two and a half rounds. Uh, we move on. We got David Dvorak taking on Steven Urseg. Minus 240 for Dvorak, plus 230, or 220 for Steven Urseg. Uh, I looked at some of the tape on Urseg. He's very, very tall for 125 pounds. I believe he's five foot nine. Um, I didn't mind a lot of the stuff that I saw on tape. I, I think he struggles as a lot of guys who are a little, like tall for their weight class struggles with a little bit of head movement. Um, he could be right for the taking with that, but he hasn't been finished. He's an Australian prospect. 
Um, seems to have a pretty well-rounded game, but it's 125 pounds. Everybody at 125 pounds has a pretty well-rounded game. I think people did pretty well. I think this opened up and there was like plus 350 or something to be had on Urseg. Um, some of the, like the early opener on this had him as high as plus 385. I think people did really, really well to snag up some value here. Now that the market's settled to minus 270, plus 220, it's like you still have to kind of accept the fact that Urseg's taking this fight on short notice against somebody who's been in the UFC for quite some time, hasn't exactly had the best run recently, but he's been fighting legitimate, legitimate opponents, uh, that being... Uh, Dvorak like obviously losing to like Nikolau it's like these are like top 15 guys so mm. I think the market's pretty settled at this point I don't see much of an edge at least at this point in the week um, still from a betting perspective if I was to add this to my card I think it would still be a dog or pass situation but I think I'm going to lean towards a pass but Urseg will be the pick for the purposes of the show what's your take bud yeah, I'm still kind of looking for that one big underdog to jump on. So Urseg kind of caught my eye. I said, uh, maybe flyweight action. Flyweight's known for the odd upset. Don't really care too much for David Dvorak. And it's short notice for Urseg, but it's also short notice for David Dvorak in the sense that he doesn't have enough time to, he hasn't had as much time to prepare for this one singular opponent. So maybe it throws him off just enough that uh, Urseg comes and gets the job done. Watch some tape on him. I like the kid. He's a decent enough counterpuncher. Tall for the division, like you said. I think that's what makes him an effective counterpuncher. His opponents generally have to reach in way farther to get to the target, and then he's good at uh, kind of throwing one back, right? Wrestling, all right, but his grappling's good. Grappling's good, opportunistic with his submissions, throws up all types of stuff, likes the guillotine, likes to take the back, likes the rear naked choke. Could probably give Dvorak some problems. I just don't get the balls to do it, man, because here's what I keep coming back to, right? David Dvorak, this guy was on a, like a 13-fight winning streak when he came to the UFC, and he won his three fights in the UFC, because when you match him up against low-level guys, even low- to mid-level guys, he's going to pull off the win, and so wins his first three UFC fights, and then, of course, they're going to give you that step-up in competition. So, Matus Nikolaou, Matus Nikolaou is a top-10 guy. He got dropped in that fight, but still survived for the decision. And then they give him a Nel Cop, who, for the record, is like a top-10 guy. And he gets dropped in that fight, and he still survives the decision. So a couple bad fights against top 10 guys. He got hurt and, and knocked down in both of them. He came back to at least survive decisions. He tried to make them as competitive as he can. He's just not an elite-level guy. You know, similar to a Dan Ige, he's world-class. He's great when he's fighting, you know, that that step down. It's really that jump up in competition seems to kind of have snared him. So I can't hold anything against this guy. He's got a full camp. He can wrestle. He's got a nasty left high kick. He, you know, he moves quite okay. Volume leaves a little bit to be to be desired, but at the same time, not bad at all. So there's things I like about Dvorak. Eckert, here's the one thing that got me in, right? So look at his record, right? He turns pro in 2016, okay? But his amateur career spans from 2014 to 2019. So even though he's a pro fighter, he signs up for a gamma amateur MMA contest and ends up losing to Dennis Bondar. Now, Dennis Bondar went 16 and 3 in pro MMA, okay? Signed to the UFC, was a huge favorite over Malcolm Gordon. And it turns out he's awful. He's awful. Malcolm Gordon thrashes him and breaks his arm all in the span of like two or three minutes. Yeah. So he lost in 2019 as an amateur to Bondar. Not a good look. So then you got to look at his pro record. And it's like, well, geez, most of these fights he was fighting amateur at the same time. So how many of them are legit? And how, like, they're legit, they happen. I just mean, what was the level is all I'm getting at. Went over Shannon Ross first round. Nice win. Incredible win. Shannon Ross eventually made his way to the Contender Series in the UFC, so decent enough. Some of these wins, you watch them, the kid don't look too bad. But five of his last six fights have ended inside of the very first round. The one fight, Cody Hayden, that actually goes the distance, he tires. His cardio's not all that good. So you've got a bunch of first-round finishes. The one fight that goes beyond the first round, you noticeably slow down in fatigue, and now you're taking a fight on 10 days' notice in British Columbia, coming down from Australia against David Dvorak, who, who just went the distance with Matus Nikolaou and Manel Kopp despite getting dropped in both of those fights. Like, ah, that's a tough task, man. That's a real tough task. And so oftentimes in the regional scene, a guy can look really good, and then that jump up is what does them in. David Dvorak, on the on the Czech Republic uh, regional scene, on the Slovakian regional scene, yeah, he was kick cleaning up. Guy looked legit. The jump up got him. The jump up will get Steve the same way, so... I am going to take David Dvorak, but uh, 
one of these dogs are going to come through. I think I think he's got a decent chance, but uh, I, I again, I got to settle with the favorite. Got to go with experience. Got to go with what we do know. Cardio, better striking. Got to got to go with what we know, Paul. No, you're you're right. You're 100 percent right. I mean, I always kind of like when I make a lot of these picks is like I take what I think is still slightly the value side, but I'm not betting too many minus 270s in general. I did watch mm. the Haddon fight and I was just like, you know, what's a big problem is not having 15 minute cardio at flyweight because everybody has. It. And I noticed <laughs> right. the same things as you. I was like, he's slowing down a lot. Like he was still able to get away with it. But like some of the scrambles um, in that fight, he was they were they were absolute battles i'll tell you that much and he was leaving his hands down um it wasn't exactly a great look and two of like those wins in the first round are against some guy named paul loga um who was five and four and seven and five when he fought him in those fights like it's low level of competition he has a big long frame he's how old is he uh 27 so it's like this is this is the time for him this should be your prime um and having a win over sun Gook Choi, who is on um uh road to the ufc is a pretty good look i did not actually get a chance to go back and watch that fight um but that would be an interesting rewatch uh let's just get into the final fight here we got maria Oliveira taking on diana belbita so that we don't talk about, you know, CF DOP or anything like that. I lined this one as a straight pick them because certain books across the market, like some at some of them, Oliveira's the ever so slight favorite. At others, Belbita's the ever so slight favorite. It is a straight pick them. There is no picking a dog here, Cody. Who you got? Yeah, so UFC goes to Brazil. These Brazilians will go seven and one. They go to France. The French will go seven and one. Wherever they go, the hometown crowd mops it up. Yeah, I don't think it's the case in Canada. It actually is never the case in Canada. But certainly not this card. To this point, I got Team Canada going two and three. Down to Belbita, not technically Canadian, Romanian. However, Canadian citizenship lives Canada, trains Canada, training partners on this card, all Canada. I'll pick Diana Belbita to get us back to a three and three, a mediocre push for the night. Uh, yeah, it's a 50 50 fight in every sense of the word. I completely do agree with that, Paul. With Maria Oliveira, though, it seems like she's willing to just stand and scrap. Like she wants to throw down. That'll play into Belbita's hand, I think, because uh, Belbita's biggest kryptonite is the wrestling. She just can't really grapple all that well. She came from Romania as a kickboxer, she had some decent success kickboxing and fought low level competition in Romania and struggled with that initial transition into the UFC loses her first two fights but someone that keeps working and so again she's under Cruel in and I think he's done a fantastic job of improving her striking skills improving her counter wrestling anyways proving the cardio so again loses to Molly McCann lose to Lilian Joshua that one was super embarrassing because she was winning and then initiated the clinch and got armbarred doesn't matter the win over Hannah Goldie is a nice one. 117 significant strikes landed, scored a knockdown, ground game looked vastly improved, 15-minute cardio, momentum's on her side. She takes on Gloria De Paola, and like that fight could have gone either way. Balbita started out really hot. By the numbers, it was separated by one strike, I think 88 to 87 for a Gloria De Paola. But strong argument, Balbita could have won that fight. In fact, maybe she did win that fight. But uh, again, it's just you could just see that she's going to need more setbacks. She's going to got to go to the drawing board. That fight would be good for her because it would let let her know. Got to work that cardio. Got to work certain things to her game. Clinch is getting a little bit better as well. Going to need some improvements there. When I look like when I look at Maria Oliveira, her best path would be utilizing some wrestling, trying to get this fight to the ground. But she doesn't have any wrestling. Not for the most part, anyway. She's been getting out grappled. She seems to be more of a willing, engaging participant in a clear striking battle. And her last fight against Vanessa Demopoulos. Vanessa DeMoblis doesn't take down anybody, right? And Vanessa DeMoblis takes her down twice and furthermore scored a clean knockdown on her as well. So I think she's hittable. She doesn't move her head. She kind of stays too close in range a lot of the times. Uh, volume is not bad, but I think Balbita's got the edge in power and the edge in volume. And without the threat of the takedown, Balbita should just be able to win what is essentially a sparring session. So I think uh, maybe, you know, an aggressive sparring session. They're going to be throwing heat. They're going to be trying to take each other's head off. I just don't think this fight ends inside the distance, and I think Balbita wins it. So maybe a striking tit-for-tat type battle. Have your shots from Balbita, more of them from Balbita. Wrestling, come along, come enough of a way that she should be able to stuff whatever uh, this particular opponent throws at her. But, you know, beyond that, cracking into the top 10 of the division is going to be a lot. 
tougher. But in terms of one singular fight here against Maria Oliveira, I think her wrestling's good enough to uh, keep the fight standing here and then win the fight. All right, this is shoey bet. Okay, we'll take a shoey bet. And I mean, we've got I... a 50 50 women's MMA fight, so nobody yeah, can win here, exactly. but I will take it, sure. Yeah, let's let's make a shoey bet. Here's my here's my struggle. Here's the holes I will poke in in that. I mean, the the Belbita fight where she put up like 117 significant strikes against Hannah Goldie. Well, like you've got a seven inch reach advantage. You best as well. Like you better be winning those exchanges from range. Like you are a long rangy kickboxer taking on a short stubby. Stubby is not is not the word I was looking. For. Short, uh, compact, stout, stout. That's a better word to be using. Um, uh, wrestler, grappler, striker, I guess, in her own right. But you have a lot of big advantages there. And it was one seventeen to one, or one one seventeen to ninety two in significant strikes. Um, I think Marina Oliveira. It's like taking on T- Tabitha Ricci, out stri- or getting more significant strikes over the course of fifteen minutes, and being able to su- survive. 15 minutes on the ground against somebody of that caliber. Um, I think that was kind of impressive. Uh, She got two takedowns against Gloria DePaula in a very, very close split decision. Like, we're not talking about the highest level of the division here. Um, I'm not going to be stunned if this goes either way, but I think if anybody has a slight grappling advantage here, it's going to be Maria Oliveira. And she's got a 69-inch reach um in her own right so they're pretty much a match they're 68 versus 69 they should be relatively around the same size i think it's a close competitive fight but i'm going to lean ever so slightly to the brazilian so watch me have another shoey next week because of a home cooking canadian decision but uh you know that's what people come here for um yeah so the only bets i actually have as of right now i've got maria Oliveira and belbita over two and a half rounds parlayed with the under um in the builder nelson fight and uh dan Ige plus 205 by knockouts other spots that i'm considering as of right now I don't love the board, to be perfectly honest, and I'm not betting no. every single. And people, let's face it, people come to hear the PRP, Cody. So why don't you hit them with that? It's going to have to be chalky this week to come through, but there's only 11 fights. Keep that in mind. But yeah, we're going to go with Amanda Nunes at the top. If we use her at the top, it'd be a good hedge out piece, but we have to get there first. Uh, we're going to go with Mike Malott. We're going to go with Dan Ige, uh, Mark andre Barrio, Nasruddin Imovov, uh, Miranda Maverick. Richie Lang, Blake Builder, David Dvorak, and Diana Belbita. So, yeah, it's it's favorites across the board. The one thing I suppose it's like there's good value, I think. I don't know. There's value on a couple of these guys. It just depends what you consider value and how you're playing it, I suppose. I would say attack this from a prop standpoint, but, like, the props are equally as greasy. Uh, prize picks. Prize pick looks pretty decent this week. Paul mentioned a couple of his favorite plays on him. Like, I can't disagree with any of them. I think it looks pretty good. The numbers look pretty good. So hopefully that's profitable. But yeah, we're just going to need a couple bounces here and there and and hopefully get at least like our core four through, if not our top six picks get through. But yeah, we're going to we're betting against most of the Canadians. So hopefully the the decisions aren't that egregious and the judging's not that bad. And then, of course, yeah, banana peels are getting getting clipped early in the first round. Like whatever can happen wrong. Murphy's Law, basically, whatever can go wrong generally does go wrong but uh this is our home soil paul we can't get thrashed in canada i got thrashed last week so let me get that one out of the way the way and uh jump back on the straight and narrow here so yeah hopefully amanda nunez doesn't go and blow one because uh have seen her do that before yeah i got thrashed last week too bro don't worry about it the only bet i won was was jim miller inside the distance i also had some on him by submission and Boy, oh boy, that fight was just done before it even started. So um, everything else that I'll, I touched was, was I'll bad. tell you what's, got, what hurt me. Smoked. Absolutely. Yeah, I uh, so Jamie Malarkey loses, and then right off the get-go, it's like, oh, man. Like, he was a top-ticket guy. He was the biggest favorite on the card, and he just gets thrashed so bad. It's like, okay, I'm going to rebuild. And rebuilding is not generally a great idea, but it was early enough in the card. I was like, I'm just going to rebuild. So I put some smoker parlays together, man. John Castanada comes through. He was only minus 120. He juiced most of them up. We're going, we're going, we're going. I fell asleep. I fell asleep right after the co-main event. (laughs) 
So I woke up and I was like in a daze, but uh, it was on Fight Pass. Like the whole replay is on Fight Pass. So I don't know who wins, but I can now use it, watch it using skip technology. Mm-hmm. So I watched it. I think Kai Car France wins. I'm like, I made a bunch of money and I, I skipped to the decision and I skipped like, I don't know, five frames too early and all bozzy has got his hands up and it was like a gut wrenching feeling. <laughs> so, you know what? Had I stayed up and watched it live, I, I could have hedged out like, not only Kai Car France is minus 400, like with a minute left in the fight, hedge out, but like you could have just not even bet the fight altogether. You could just hedge out right then and there because like four or five fighters all came through before him. So anyway, it's, it's a say la vie type thing. You kind of got to watch these fights live because you can bet live, which of course I think is the sharpest way to bet. And uh, you can pull the shoe when you got parlays going, you've got someone that you're trying to hedge on. Uh, I just, I let it roll. And unfortunately the judges got it wrong. So that one cost me, but. I've gotten some good bounces my way in the past as well. So I'm not, I'm not too sour about it. It's just, we know what we're getting ourselves into and this is what it is. Yeah. Judging in MMA, it is what it is. You just have to kind of, you just have to deal with it. It's like, I I don't even think it was the worst scorecard. Like I can see the argument for, for him winning the first three rounds, um, for Albazi winning the first three rounds. It was how Chris Lee got to it. That was like the biggest, it's like, how do you give him round four? Like, if your scorecard is that, then your scorecard is horrible. Like, either, round four was one of the most, more conclusive rounds, uh, probably the most conclusive round of the entire fight. Kai Kara France absolutely whooped him. I, I don't have the stats right in front of me right now, but it was like, it was like 38 to five or something like that in significant strikes. So it wasn't even remotely close. So the fact that these idiots, these Goombas, have so much power every single week and consistently week after week, we see just like how, like you, you clearly don't exactly know what you're doing. Um, I don't know how, how we end up doing it, but that's just the, that's just the, the bed that we make. That's the part of the variance that we involve ourselves in every single week by betting on this crazy sport. Anyway, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. Let's win some money this week. For producer Megan and Cody Saftik, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. (laughs) 